we get started as usual at the terminal window. You can see here I've got my four standard terminal tabs. I've got a server running here. I've got spork running here. I've got auto test. Let's uh, do a control C to make sure we're green. Indeed we are. And then here's the main tab where we can issue commands. Now it's before we start on the master branch, but I'd like to work on a topic branch for uh, modeling users. So let's do git checkout dash b to create a new branch modeling users and now we're ready to get going with our uh, with our data modeling and with the first initial steps toward creating a user profile page ultimately we are going to turn this page here into a user sign up page but right now it would do little good to have a form here on this page to accept user signups because we don't have any place to store the user information so this first section is going to deal with uh, making a, a user data model uh, essentially identical to the one that we used in the demo application. There will be uh, names and email addresses associated with each user. But unlike the demo app, we're going to write tests and we're also going to do all of the kinds of data validations that you would need for a real world application. As part of this, we'll be learning about Active Record, which is the default Rails library for dealing with the database. Now, underneath the hood, our user data will be stored in a relational database, which is a kind of database that uses a language called Structured Query Language, or SQL, sometimes pronounced SQL, although I will avoid that pronunciation in this screencast series. One of the nice things about Rails is that it insulates you from SQL to a large degree. SQL is kind of messy and ugly, and uh, Rails gives you pure Ruby interfaces to SQL so that you can defer learning SQL for quite some time, in fact, possibly forever. Uh, we will be dealing with a little bit of raw SQL in uh, the final lesson of this screencast series, lesson 12, but throughout the rest of the tutorial, we're going to be using pure Ruby to interface with the database uh, through Active Record, which is as I mentioned, the default uh, Rails library for dealing with databases, and through something called migrations, which we're going to do right now. Uh, migrations are an interface to the SQL uh, DDL, the database definition language, which is really ugly and brittle. And uh, migrations give us a nice Ruby interface, a pretty flexible interface um, to, to the underlying DDL. So let's get started with that. The first step is almost the same as the one we used in the demo application. Recall that we generated a scaffold for uh, the user's resource, and as part of that, it created a migration, which we invoked using rake db migrate. In this lesson, instead of generating the scaffolding, we're only going to generate the model. Remember, in the last lesson, we generated a controller for users, and in this lesson, we'll do rails generate model, and then singular user. So uh, models are singular, controllers are plural. And as in the case of the demo app, we're going to put the, uh, the basic data model on the command line. Recall that we're going to have names for our users, so each user will have a name, which is a string, and an email address, which is also a string. And you can see here that one of the files that got created was this migration. And uh, this first part of the migration file name is a timestamp. And uh, the reason that that's useful is because it used to be that migrations were numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, and that was fine for single developers, but it was terrible for collaborative teams because if you had more than one person uh, making migrations, you would end up with a conflict in the file name. And so these timestamps um, allow you to uh, have a distributed team of programmers who, who are all making these, uh, these migrations. So you can give the ability to change the data model to more than one person. So let's take a look at that file that, that got created there. It's in db migrate, and here it is. So we can look at the overall structure of this document. You can see that there's a class at the top, and it inherits from active record migration. And as usual, we don't actually have to know what active record migration is, but as you can probably tell from the name, it's a class that's defined by the Rails framework itself. Now inside this class, we have um, two methods. We've got self.up and self.down. 
Uh, it's not particularly important what self is in this context, but what, what this does is it creates a method for up, which is what gets executed when you do rake db migrate. And then if you look at the down method, this is what happens when you do rake db rollback. It's essentially the inverse of up. And so then looking inside here, you can see that there's create table, which is a method. It takes an argument, which is a symbol with the name of the table in the database we want to create. And then there's a block, do t, and here t is a Ruby variable that uh, d is used by Rails to define the data model. And so you can see here that there's t.string, which creates a name in the database, and t.email, which creates an email. So these are uh, the creation of columns. In a database table, each attribute corresponds to a column in the database. And then there's this line, this t.timestamps. Um, this creates the two magic columns that I mentioned briefly before in the series. And we'll see in a moment uh, when we start with the uh, Rails console um, exactly what this does. So as with the, the demo app, let's uh, rake db migrate to update the, uh, the data model in the database. So rake db migrate. So this created a table for our users. Let's take a look at the data model in this little uh, diagram. Remember that there's an ID that gets created automatically by Rails, which is the, the primary key identifying the user, and it's an integer. Then there are the name and email attributes that we just created. And then there are the two magic columns, created at and updated at. And these are uh, date time data types. And you can probably guess what they do. They record when the user was created and when the user was last updated. And as you may have guessed by now, it's the created at and updated at columns that get created by the t.timestamps line that we saw before in the migration. Now, as you may recall, Rails uses the SQLite database by default in, uh, in development. And it's really quite convenient because it just consists of single files. So we can see right here this development.sqlite3. This is the database for our development environment. And in particular, it's the database that's just been updated with, uh, with the new data model. Uh, and the data model itself is in schema.rb. So let's take a look at schema.rb. Schema.rb. And you can see here that this is essentially the, uh, the same thing that we saw in, uh, in the migration. This is a, a representation of what is currently in the database. And now we can actually look at the, the database itself using a program called uh, SQLite Database Browser. And you can find this online if you, uh, if you Google around. It's cross-platform. And I have my system configured to use it to open SQLite 3 files by default. So I can do open development, I'm sorry, db development SQLite 3. And here it is. This is the SQLite database browser. And if you look here under database structure, there's a users table. And if you look at the, the data, it's exactly what, uh, what we had in the little diagram. So let's take a look. So you can see here that we have an ID, a name, and email column created at and updated at. And if we click on browse data and go down to the users table, we can see that there are columns corresponding to those uh, attributes, ID, name, email, created at, and updated at. Now, of course, we don't currently have any records in this database, but you can see here how the columns in the database table correspond to the attributes defined by the data model. Now, as I mentioned before, we can undo a migration by doing rake db rollback. So let's just do that for practice. Rake db rollback. Now, if you look at schema.rb, there's nothing here. And if we look at this and refresh it, let's just reopen it. And here you see that there is no users table in this, uh, in this database. All right. All right, so before proceeding, of course, we want to, uh, to rake db migrate. So now let's take a look at our actual user model file. We saw this in the context of the demo app. And here it is. It's an app models. 
user.rb. And as before, we see that it's just uh, a very simple inheritance. It's almost an empty file. All we have is class user inheriting from active record base. Uh, but we learned before that this gives us all kinds of great functionality. And we're going to be exploring that and exploiting that in uh, this lesson. Now, before moving on, uh, I'm going to implement an optional step, but one that I find very useful, which is to uh, install a gem that will allow us to annotate our models so that we can see the data model when we look at the model file. So let's do that. We have to edit the gem file. Here's the gem file. And I'm going to add to development gem annotate models. Close this down. Remember, anytime you edit the gem file, you have to run bundle install. And now we can annotate the user by typing annotate. Let's take a look at the result of that. There we go. So we've got in the, uh, the user.rb file the data model itself. And this is very convenient because sometimes it, it's hard to remember exactly which columns you have, especially when you have a more complicated data model. And uh, so model annotation is, is useful for this purpose. Now, before we move on, there's uh, one extra step to take. This step is not at all obvious uh, if you haven't already done a lot of Rails programming, but it's so important that I'm going to introduce it even at this early stage. Um, what we need to do is identify which attributes of this model are accessible to the outside world. That is to say, uh, which attributes can be modified through uh, some sort of web interface. If you look at the data model here, you definitely do not want users being able to change their IDs. Users should not be able to change when they were created or updated. When I say user in this context, I mean an actual user of the web application, someone clicking around and submitting things to forms. Uh, but we do want to make name and email accessible because, of course, in the process of registering or updating their information, users will be changing their name and email addresses. So the way to do this is to say atra accessible and then a list of the symbols corresponding to the attribute, so name and email. We'll be talking more about this later on in the tutorial, but uh, this step is, is uh, as I mentioned, so important from a security perspective that we really need to do this first before moving on. At this stage, we've made enough changes that it's probably a good idea to make a commit uh, to our application, so let's do that. Let's add everything and say git commit dash m, and then we want to say uh, created a user model, user model. This is good enough for now. Now that we've created our initial user model, um, let's uh, interact with it a little bit just to get a sense of how everything works. Uh, this will uh, be a more detailed treatment of some of the same things that we did in the context of the demo app. And as in that case, we're going to use the Rails console. For the, the case of this current sample application, though, we are going to be using some sample data. And we're going to be creating users and destroying them through the web application. And so I don't actually want this console session to affect the real database, the, the actual local development database. And so there's a way to do that in the console. You can do Rails console dash dash sandbox. And so this runs the console in a sandbox. And what a sandbox is, is essentially uh, a special environment where any changes you make to the database will automatically be rolled back. And you can see that it gives you a line here. Any modifications you make will be rolled back on exit. This is especially important if you're going to be running a console on a production application just to, to look and see what's going on. But you know you don't want to make changes to the database. Now, when using the console to uh, interact with models, I often find it useful to take a look at what's happening in the development log, which will give us a, a, some insight into the kinds of operations that we're performing um, in our application. So let's, let's do that. I'm going to leave the terminal window here so that we can see what happens in the log. The way to see what's happening in the log is to run the tail command. And in this case, I'm going to be tailing a file, so tail-f, and then log development.log. 
Now recall that the uh, Rails console actually gives us access to the full Rails environment, including the model. So we can do something like user.new to instantiate a new user object. And you can see that by default, everything is nil. All of the attributes are nil. But of course, most of the time, you actually want to instantiate a user with um, initial values for the various attributes. In this case, the two attributes that we're actually going to be writing to are the name and email. The ID created at and updated at columns will be created automatically by Active Record. Let's take a look at this. Let's make a, a variable called user and say user equals user dot new. And now we're going to pass an initialization hash with name is uh, my name and email. So we're using symbols and hashes here. Remember, in the context of uh, uh, of a hash passes an argument like this, we don't need the curly braces for a hash. So if you have email is mhartle at example.com. So that created a new user in memory just inside this console session. But notice that nothing happened in the development log. Um, that's because creating a user with user.new doesn't actually affect the database. In order to write the change, in order to create the user in the database, you need to call the save method on this uh, user object. So here we have a user, and if we call save, you can see that down here in the log, there is an insert statement. So th this is a raw SQL, insert into users, and then a bunch of stuff. This is the kind of code that you don't have to write because of Active Record. Running user.save uh, automatically does this insert into the database. One thing you may have noticed here is that when user.save succeeds, it returns the value true. And we'll see that this is useful for Boolean tests. We can say if user.save and then do something based on whether the user was saved or not. In particular, uh, the save will fail if any of the validations fail. But of course, currently we don't have any validations, so the, the save succeeded. Uh, you might also note here that when we created the new user, in memory, the ID was nil, created at was nil, and updated at was nil. But after we save the user, those attributes uh, take on value. So let's take a look at user, just print it out to the screen. And now you see that the user ID is 1, and the created at and updated at columns have uh, the proper timestamps. Now, you may notice this timestamp here. Uh, in case you're curious, I'm actually screencasting during the day, but uh, you can see that this, this is a, at 20 hundred hours, this is almost 9 p.m. Um, that's because this timestamp is in what's known as uh, UTC, which is Coordinated Universal Time. In case you're confused about why it isn't called CUT, it's because uh, the international body that came up with the abbreviation couldn't agree on whether to use uh, the English version, C-U-T, or the French version, which is um, T-U-C, and so they compromised by calling it U-T-C, which is awesome because it's, it's not true in any language. There's no correspondence between the letters and the words in any language. So apparently that was a good enough compromise. And, uh, and here we've got created at and updated at columns both in U-T-C. Now we can access any of these uh, individual attributes using the dot operator, user dot name, for example, user dot email, or user dot created at. Now you may wonder if you uh, if you recall where we created a user class with uh, the explicit attributes spelled out using uh, atra accessor. Let's take a look at that. I'll just work in my home directory since we're not going to even do anything with this file. But if you look at a user class, remember we did this. We did atra accessor name and email. This created getter and setter methods for name and email attributes associated with the instances of this class, that is to say with user objects. But so how is it the case that Active Record knows to create name and email attributes for our users? The answer is that Active Record actually looks at the database and infers from the names of the columns that there should be attributes corresponding to ID, name, email, created at, and updated at. So this is really convenient because as we change our data model, the uh, methods available on each user object will automatically be updated.
Now that we've learned how to create a user using a two-step process, first by instantiating a user object in memory and then saving it to the database, uh, we're going to learn how to do it in one step with the create method. So let's do that user, capital user, dot create. And then, there's an, and then there's an initialization hash. This is another user. Now, you may have noticed that by creating the users with user.create, we actually managed to create IDs and the timestamps created at and updated at at the same time as uh, instantiating the user object. And you can see that user.create actually returns uh, the, the user that was created. So here we've assigned uh, the user uh, with name foo to the local variable foo. So let's take a look at this. If we look at foo, we can see that foo, is in, in fact, is just a user in memory. But foo has also already been saved to the database. Now, in this case, the reason that I assigned this second user to a variable is because I want to show you how to destroy a user as well as how to create one. So let's, let's do foo.destroy. You can see here that the destroy method also returns the user that's just been destroyed. So let's take a look at the development log that we're tailing. So we can see here a couple of inserts. These are the inserts corresponding to the create command, these guys. But then you can see that there's another uh, SQL command here, delete from users, where users.id equals 3, right, in this line here. Although you may be confident that Active Record is working correctly, it's always nice to see uh, a correspondence in the, in the log with the raw SQL. And by the way, you can learn a lot about SQL just by looking at the server logs and, uh, and looking at which sort of SQL commands correspond to the Active Record commands. And now that we know how to uh, create and destroy users, it's nice to be able to find them in the database. This is a, a core operation for any web application, is to retrieve information from the database so that we can render views. So let's take a look at how this works. One of the most common ways of finding users in the database is to use the user model and then call the find method. We've actually seen this briefly once before. And the way this works is you give it the ID of the user you're looking for. In this case, let's find user one. That's good. That's in fact the, the first user in the database. And let's, now let's try to find uh, the, the, the third user, the one that we just deleted user.find3, you can see that it raises an active record, record not found exception right here, couldn't find user with ID equal to 3. The reason that it raises an exception is because the find method is designed such that it's only called when you are confident that there is such a user in the database, and uh, you do want to raise uh, an error if the user doesn't exist. Sometimes you want to find a user by ID, uh, but you don't care if the user doesn't exist. And so just to show you how that works, you do user.findById. In this case, it just returns nil when the user doesn't exist. Now, as you might guess by the existence of a method called findById, uh, Active Record provides finders for uh, various attributes. So for example, user.findByEmail will find the user uh, by the email address. And now this is a particularly useful finder because in our application, as is a commonplace on the web nowadays, we are going to use the email address as the unique user login. And so this is exactly the kind of find that we'll use when uh, having users log in. Finally, you may recall that there are various methods for uh, finding particular users by uh, some sort of abstract idea. For example, user.first, rather than finding the user with ID 1, which isn't always necessarily the first user, uh, we'll find actually the first user in the database. There we go. In this case, it is the user with ID 1. We, we can also do user.last, which in this case is just the second user. And we can also do user.all.
We've seen this before as well. This just returns all the users in the database. As we saw in the case of the demo app, the users index page, which is uh, at the URL slash users, should show by default at least all of the users, and we pull them out of the database using user.all. There's one more way to manipulate user objects in the database that uh, will be useful for our web application, which is to update user attributes, uh, possibly just one at a time. So let's take a look at that. Let's just take a look at what our user is. There's our user. Now remember what after accessor did in the case of the user class defined in lesson four. Um, it created getter and setter methods so that we could do things like user.email equals and then a particular value. So active record allows us to do this with the attributes for the, the user objects, and then it gives us an easy way to save those results to the database. So if we do user.email equals, say, example.net, then we can save that result to the database using user.save. It's important to understand that in the first case, in user.email equals this value, all we did was change the value of the email address of the user in memory inside the console session. It didn't do anything to the database. It's only the second step that, that changed the database, this user.save. And we can see an example of exactly how that works by, uh, by actually assigning an email address and then reloading the user from the database. So let's do that. Let's, we can do user.email equals mhartle at example.edu. And now we can retrieve the user from the database by doing user.reload. And you can see here the email attribute is, is the one that we uh, changed it to just above. And so if you do user.email, it's just mhartle at example.net. So what happened there is that this, this line here changed the value in memory, but since we didn't save the value to the database, when we reloaded the user, uh, we retrieved the, the, the value of the email address that, that was in the database. You also may have noticed before that the uh, created at and updated at columns were identical for newly created users. In fact, we can look at the second user to see an example of this, created at and updated at columns, they're both this exact same timestamp, this guy here. But now if we look at the first user in the database, the created at columns and updated at columns actually differ. The created at column only gets set the first time the user is created, but the updated at column changes any time you change a user's attributes. Now it's nice to be able to change um, attributes one by one using this, uh, this assignment syntax, but it's often more convenient to update multiple attributes at once um, using a, a method called update attributes. So if you have a user object, just remember our user, and you want to update the attributes, you can do user.update attributes and then pass it a hash. Say the new name is the dude and uh, the email is dude.abides.org. And notice here, for no apparent reason, I used single quoted strings. This, this is a common thing in, in Rails applications and in Ruby generally, is that sometimes you'll just flip back and forth between single and double quoted strings when it doesn't matter. Of course, if you need to do interpolation, you have to use double quoted strings or some equivalent, you, you can't use single quoted strings. But just uh, if this bothers you, you're just going to have to get used to it because this happens a lot. So we can take a look at the user attributes. User.email is due to divides.org. Uh, now I should mention that the only attributes that you can update in this way with the user.updateAttribute -update method uh, are exactly those attributes that are defined as accessible. These are the attributes that you can uh, change using the update attributes method. Um, if an attribute isn't listed as being attribute accessible, then it can't be updated in, in that way. Um, so for example, the ID created at updated at columns in this case can't be updated using update attributes. And, and that's, a, that's a feature, that's not a bug, it's a feature, because this is in fact the, the method that you will end up using to update user attributes when they uh, submit a web form and uh, include their new name or their new email address. And we certainly don't want users to be able to change things like their ID or their, uh, or their magic columns.
part of the reason I mention this is that some of the time what will happen when you're developing is you'll discover that for some reason you can't understand, you are unable to update a particular attribute um, using update attributes. And that the answer will always be the same. It will be because you forgot to add the new attribute to this after accessible line. Um, it can be a little confusing sometimes, but with things like security, it's uh, better to err on the side of caution.